I want to welcome you to Between Skepticism and Mysticism, an Introduction to the Occult Philosophy of Cornelius Agrippa. This entire lecture series on the foundations of the occult philosophy is brought to you totally free of charge, completely open access by the incredibly generous folks that support my work over at my Patreon. This is all a bit of an experiment on providing free content through crowdsourcing education on topics that are just honestly rarely taught in universities at all. And when they are taught, a single class can cost thousands of dollars. If you'd like to support the production of university level open access education and topics in Western esotericism, I'd hope you consider taking a look at my Patreon, which you can join for as little as $54 a year. It's like buying me a cup of coffee or a, a beer once a month. But thank you so much for your consideration of supporting the channel and the work like this. And thanks to the patrons of this channel for making this lecture series possible. All right, everyone, welcome back to our uh, summer seminar on Cornelius Agrippa, or rather the occult philosophy of Cornelius Agrippa. And uh, today we're finally going to get into some of Agrippa's actual writings, which is nice because we've been talking about so much framing and so much other stuff um, that we haven't really got into his actual text yet, but we are going to at least begin that process today. But it is going to take a little detour into kind of talking about where Renaissance magic is in the early 16th century, because we have to, in order to understand uh, just where the three books of occult philosophy in its form that we're going to talk about uh, of the juvenile draft, the 1510 juvenile draft, we have to understand sort of where it fits into medieval philosophy or, or, or medieval uh, magic or early modern magic or Renaissance magic more generally, because uh, Agrippa is going to be quite complicated and how he's going to fit into that entire situation. And in some ways, Agrippa is going to be part of the sort of magical reformist avant-garde. And in some ways, Agrippa is going to be very much uh, backwards looking, uh, very medieval in his orientation. And we'll see that the three books of occult philosophy kind of acts as a, a bit of a hinge um, between uh, Renaissance and early modern um, magical theory. And uh, to what degree we can say that um, Agrippa actually shaped the, the trajectory of how Western magic was going to go down. I think he had a dramatic impact on it, as, uh, but we'll come to that later. But a um, couple of things to note about the, um, about the occult philosophy of Agrippa before we, before we move on. Um, the first thing to know is that the, the occult philosophy is not a static question, but which is to say you cannot go to the three books of occult philosophy uh, published in 1533 and say that's Agrippa's philosophy. That would be a, a kind of mistake because the 1533 is a, is a complicated text that is very much downstream of almost everything else Agrippa had done throughout his life. And in order to understand the 1533 three books of occult philosophy, we kind of just understand how he got there. So part of what we're gonna be doing for the next several lectures is we're going to be seeing how he got there. And one of the stations along the way, of course, will be the 1510 juvenile draft, but we're also gonna be looking at the other esoteric, directly esoteric or esoteric adjacent works, which also survive, although many of them are not translated. And we're gonna to have to see that, how those actually shape the occult philosophy as well. Now, as I mentioned, most of those are not translated. Uh, there may be secretly a translation project in the works, uh, to get those out to people. So keep your ear to the ground. That might be something you'll hear about more later. But what we're going to try to do is try to consult kind of a gestalt of the occult philosophy as we go through Agrippa's uh, basically almost everything that he, he wrote that has a connection to esotericism and occultism. Not everything does. You know, he wrote a, a book on an essay on the sacrament of marriage. It's interesting, you know, uh, it's, but it's not really uh, germane to what we'll be talking about uh, throughout the course of uh, this class. So let's start at the beginning. Unfortunately, um, the first thing that Agrippa, the first public thing that Agrippa did in terms of esotericism, which was the uh, lectures on uh, Johann Reuchlin's book De Verbo Mirafico, unfortunately, those lectures are lost. We know a little bit about what they must have contained, because as you probably remember, what ended up happening is Agrippa gave a series of lectures on Reuchlin's De Verbo. I'll say more about that book just in just a second. Uh, behind Agrippa's back, uh, you know, the, the uh, I don't think it was the Dominicans this time, I think actually it actually was the Franciscans, but at any rate, um, a dude named uh, Jean Catelet um, uh, began uh, publishing 
are writing things uh, accusing Agrippa of Judaizing. And uh, Judaizing, of course, is the heresy of uh, embracing Judaism uh, to any degree within Christianity, adopting Jewish practices, uh, things like that. So at any rate, uh, the, 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 Roy the Reuchlin lectures do not survive, but what does survive is Agrippa's um, defense of the lectures over and against his detractors. So we don't have the lectures. They don't survive, which is a real pity. But what we do have is Agrippa defending himself uh, ag against uh, the charge of Judaizing, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But at any rate, um, Agrippa sort of comes out of the gate swinging. Uh, in 1509 is when we have the, the Dole lecture at, um, at, at the University of Dole, and that is where we get the, the, the De Verbo lectures. And then a year later, folks, he's already back in Cologne uh, after having not got a job, for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. But after he fails to get a job uh, at, the, at the University of Dole, he goes back to Cologne, and he is there at Spondheim uh, in 1510 already with the three books of occult philosophy already composed which tells me, I don't think he wrote the three books of occult philosophy overnight. It tells me that he's working on it this entire time, which is to say it is the result of this circle of occultists that he's with in France, that he's, he has a small circle of occultists that we know a little bit about. Sometimes this circle is referred to as the Agrippa circle, but that circle, as a, you may remember, is sort of a mutual support, but also a study group. And that study group is primarily, it seems like, from what we can tell about it, is interested in Hermeticism, Kabbalah, alchemy, um, and, and magic. So they're studying all of that in France. And I do, I think that part of what emerges out of that study group, in some sense, is the juvenile draft, the 1510 juvenile draft. We'll come back to the juvenile draft uh, probably next time, but I think it emerges really in that circle. So in some sense, Agrippa is the primary author of that text. But I think in many other ways, like many great texts in history, there's a lot of minds that work in there. There's a lot of great minds that work in there. We just don't see them because the text you know, is presented as one single text. But again, he's already uh, has some access to Kabbalah by 1509. He's lecturing on uh, Reuchlin's. So you may remember Reuchlin's book, De Verbo Mirafico. This is a book where Reuchlin argues that elements of Kabbalah are actually uh, able to affect miracles, specifically the use um, of what he calls uh, soliloquia, uh, which is a kind of theurgical magic. Uh, he wouldn't have called it magic, but a kind of theurgy, whereby one uses the divine name, yod Hey vav He with a shin, Hebrew letter shin, and you, uh, you insert that Hebrew letter shin into the yod Hey vav He and you end up with a hybrid name, Yeshua. This is a, a weird well, way of spelling uh, Joshua, Jesus. Of course, Jesus probably did not spell his name that way. Um, it was probably spelled in the Aramaic style, not the uh, Hebrew style. That doesn't matter. What does matter, though, is that for Reuchlin, this name, uh, yod heh vav -Heh, with the shin in the middle, has the ability to work miracles. It is a thaumaturgical uh, name. And it has the ability to uh, to change reality. Uh, I've made an episode on the channel if you want to check out uh, De Verbo Mirafico. Unfortunately, it is not translated to English. I don't know if it's translated to any language, maybe German. Uh, Reuchlin studies are much further advanced in, in Germany than they are in the Anglo uh, Anglophone world. But I've made an episode about it just the same. And uh, again, the big idea here is that this allows one to... Um, to basically do magic via a, a, a modified version of a divine name. Again, we don't have um, we don't have the lecture, but what we do have is the accusation by uh, Jean Catelet that he was Judaizing, and it seems like. And by the way, Reuchlin was accused of the same thing. And it seems like the big claim here is why should you need a Hebrew name in order to affect miracles? You, why would we need to have access to Hebrew in order to affect miracles? That is making Christianity dependent on Hebrew, which is a Jewish language. And uh, if if, Judy, if if Christianity uh, can best affect miraculous causation via this Hebrew thing, it, it sort of shackles, in some sense, Christianity to uh, to a particular language, to Hebrew, and that is Judaizing. I mean, it's really classic, you know, a very classical form of Judaizing. Now, Agrippa's comeback to this is that, you know, he says, look, 
I, I don't hate the rabbis, right? But, uh, and certainly he says, I don't think that the Talmud and the Kabbalah can replace Christianity. That's one of the other things he's accused of. Um, but he says, look, what I do think is that Kabbalah does have the ability to um, augment the kind of things that we already find in Christianity. So Kabbalah is a kind of an adjunct uh, to, to Christianity. Uh, and the idea basically is, look, I'm not arguing, Agrippa says, I'm not arguing that the Kabbalah should supplant uh, Christianity, but it does seem to have uh, some very important things. Now, again, remember what Agrippa thinks about the Kabbalah, like all people at this time, is that the Kabbalah had gone all the way back to Moses. And the Kabbalah, therefore, was a revelation from God to Moses that it, the Jews had held on to, even though the Jews really didn't understand what it was. Again, it's always the idea that they don't really understand what they have. But it's an authentic revelation going back to Moses, and therefore uh, it is uh, to be to be seized upon by Christians, just like the 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 uh, books of prophecy or other books from the Hebrew Bible are to be seized upon by Christians. Therefore, the Kabbalah can be seized upon by Christians, and this special technology of using the divine name in order to affect change in the world is for Agrippa and all the Christian Kabbalists totally kosher, for lack of a better word. Um, obviously, the the um, the uh, opponents of Kabbalah thought it was all made up nonsense, and therefore uh, they did not want to attach any of it to Catholicism. So at any rate, we don't have the lecture, but what we do have is his uh, attempt to defend himself. Uh, that attempt to defend himself failed for reasons that we'll talk about more in, in just a moment. Now, at the same time that Agrippa is getting himself in a ton of trouble by lecturing on De Verbo Mirafico, which why in the world he lectured on that as opposed to lecturing on basically any other standard run-of-the-mill text that he could have lectured on, as opposed, I mean, again, it's just like coming out with a really avant-garde, already very controversial text. I mean, again, Agrippa just doesn't make the best decisions sometimes. But at any rate, what ends up happening is that Agrippa, uh, at the same time that he's lecturing on Reuchlin, he's also knowing that he, in order to uh, get an academic position, he has to get that position uh, given to him by uh, Margaret of Austria, the, the Duchess of Savoy, that this area at this time was controlled by um, the Holy Roman Empire, I guess. At any rate, Margaret of Austria has to give him, has to sign off on him getting that position. So he has to kind of woo her into basically taking a, a glimpse at him and, and, and getting him this position. Now, Margaret of Austria, if you know anything about her, she was incredible woman, just like engaged in diplomacy, uh, very high level diplomat. Like she was right up there with the men. She did not, uh, she was not sort of a, a passive lady in waiting kind of character. She was absolutely a power player in the world of politics. And I think that she probably just had very little time for the, the for Cornelius Agrippa. Um, I think that it, but whatever he wrote would have gone to the bottom of the pile because she has to deal with diplomatic correspondence coming directly from kings and there's active warfare going on. So she's just an incredible woman. At any rate, what ends up happening here is that Agrippa tries to um, woo her into getting an, a, an academic position and in order to do that, he publishes or he composes the uh, Declamatio de Nobilitate, uh, the uh, declamation on the nobility and the, the pre-excellence of, of the female sex. This is basically an argument that uh, women are better than men, that women are better than men. Now, is this a work of early feminism? It's hard to say. Uh, is this a, a work that uh, is trying to, I don't know, um, get in the ear of Margaret of Austria because she's this amazing woman and therefore uh, she could use this as, as, as fodder for her arguments that she should be equal to men. I don't know, but it is an interesting book in that, um, in that it, it tries to argue that, uh, that women are superior to men. Now, the reason why this book is interesting, at least for our purposes here in this, uh, in this lecture series, is that the arguments that he gives for why women are superior to men are actually eminently bound up with Kabbalistic and Neoplatonic thinking. So another way of putting that is that many of the arguments, I think he gives nine, ultimately nine arguments, but of the arguments, what ends up occurring is that those arguments have a kind of hermetic Kabbalistic Neoplatonic flair. So already 
not only is he lecturing on the Kabbalah, but he's going to be using Kabbalistic forms of reasoning in order to argue, again, for the uh, preeminence of, of women. So what do those arguments look like? The big argument that he leads with is the scriptural argument, because it's Bible times, and you speak Bible, and you talk in Bible, and you argue from the Bible. And his argument is based on uh, etymology that is found in the Hebrew Bible that you don't probably see unless you're reading it in Hebrew, which is to say that the name for Eve uh, in Hebrew is Chava, uh, which uh, you don't really hear at all in the name Eve anymore. It's It's been totally uh, uh, mutated, so you don't hear the word Chava. But her name, Chava, Eve, means it's from Chai, Chaye. It means uh, life, the one that lives, or perhaps the one that causes us to live in the sense of being able to have children. So Eve, Chava, is life, but man... What is man? Well, he's just clay, Adama. He's Adam, he's Adama. So which is superior, Adama, clay, or Chava, life? Clearly life. And not only that, he and this is a very rabbinical way of, of thinking, and he's very much copying this kind of idea from Kabbalistic modes of thinking. Not only is Eve's name Chava from life, but if you look at the Tetragrammaton, yod Hey vav Hey. And if you don't know Hebrew, which Agrippa doesn't really know, you can kind of squint and look sideways at it. And what do you see? You can kind of see in yod Hey vav Hey chava right? Or maybe even the with a Yud in front of it, you could even read it as in the causative, the Hithil form, kind of. So what Agrippa is thinking now, the Hey doesn't make the th sound, and, you know, so there's all kinds of problems with that. But what Agrippa is thinking is, that the the graphical or maybe uh, sound of Chava's name is somehow linked to yod heh vav -Hey. Somehow linked to yod heh vav -Hey. And therefore, she's closer to God than Adama, just regular old clay, regular old dirt. So already, that's a very Kabbalistic kind of argument. It's the kind of argument you see in the Zohar. It's the kind of argument you see in the Sefer Bahir. This is a very Kabbalistic argument for the superiority of all women, because all women are descendant of Chava, and if Chava is life, then they're all superior to Adam. That's the first argument. The other ones, right, um, women's genitals uh, are actually concealed, therefore they're like inside of their body, as opposed to male genitals, which are outside of the body. Um, and so, um, therefore, women are inherently more modest than men, Men are just sort of all, all hanging out and, and disgusting, whereas women are, are concealed and therefore they're, they're more holy somehow. Uh, also, the face, a very important idea in, in Kabbalah, the face, which is uh, very much thought to be like the face of God because they're made in the image of God. Women's faces are revealed. They're not covered up by a beard, uh, whereas men's faces are obscured. And therefore, the face shines for women in a way that it does not shine for men. Men uh, have their faces obscured uh, by, by beards, at least some of us do. Other arguments um, um, that, come, that come here, um, uh, women tend to uh, lend more to babies when babies are being uh, gestated. Men, well, it's not much. Men don't really contribute a whole lot, right? It's sort of just a, a, a drop of sperm and that's it. Uh, whereas women, they contribute flesh and blood directly to the formation of the child. And therefore all children in some sense are derivative of women, even men. Men contribute very little. Uh, further, some women, at least one woman, has been able to conceive a baby without having to, uh, without having to have sex with a man. Uh, and again, sex is kind of poo poo poo. So Mary, right? Mary, Mary was able to generate Jesus without having had sex uh, with a man, and that is uh, that's a flex. That's uh, that's more than a man. Man is never men cannot make babies on their own, and they certainly have never made a baby by themselves. Whereas at least one woman has, uh, specifically the Virgin, the Virgin Mary. Um, he argues that women are gifted with finer speech than men, uh, and are rarely born mute. I don't know if that's actually true. But uh, men, uh, I don't know if you've ever hung around with sailors or whatever, men can be very gruff of speech, Agrippa says, 
whereas women are typically uh, gifted with much finer speech. Women have far better singing voices than men, he argues. Um, uh, uh, boys have very good singing voices, but uh, they lose that as they get older. This is the, the tradition of the castrati. Uh, they try to maintain those fine seeking voices by um, uh, castrating young boys, whereas women have beautiful voices throughout the course of their entire life. Um, men, of course, committed original sin. It was Adam who uh, committed the first sin. It's debatable. Um, and are, interestingly enough, and this is not an argument I've heard from anyone else, but it's because Adam committed the first sin that Christ had to become male on earth. If women had committed the first sin, Christ would have been a woman. This is an interesting argument that I, I don't know that I've ever heard this argument before. But, uh, and, and of course, obviously, Christ had to be uh, made into flesh and he had to suffer greatly. And that's men's fault. It's not women's fault. Right, uh, that Christ had to be incarnated as a male and suffer uh, as such. Um, women, of course, have the best of people. Mary, you know, it's a, the best of people. Men have produced the worst of people. Judas, Judas is the worst, and so uh, we cannot count uh, the best to us. But we can count the worst. Women can count the best to them in the form of Mary. Uh, also on the screen there on that slide, uh, there is just a list. Uh, Grippa just goes through and just mentions every amazing woman he can think of. And just how awesome they are. Uh, I love the fact that uh, uh, here you can see on the, the list, uh, you can see everyone from Huldah, who was the Israelite prophetess that vouched for Josiah's um, scroll that he found in a wall, uh, all the way down to Hildegard. Hildegard of Bingen uh, is mentioned as a prophetess uh, by Agrippa, which is interesting that, you know, Agrippa knows of Hildegard. And uh, you can see many other famous women there, Devora, uh, but he mentions. Um, uh, Br Brigida, and he mentions, um, uh, yeah, Sappho and Hildegard and all kinds. So it's just interesting that he just has a long list of like badass women, you know, all the cool ladies uh, from history and just how awesome they all are. Um, he also mentions that women can do all the things that men can do. Uh, for instance, they can become popes. This is the famous legend of Pope Joan. Uh, and also they can become very fine warriors. And one of the very fine warriors that he does mention, of course, um, is uh, the Amazons, and uh, he also mentions, um, oh, what's her name? Um, she had just been killed recently. Uh, I'll think of her name in a minute. Uh, I can't believe it slipped my mind. Uh, but at any rate, uh, they could be fine warriors. And finally, uh, he argues that if it were not for the tyranny of men, that is to say the physical violence that men can impose upon women, uh, he does argue that men are naturally stronger than women on average, and therefore they can use um, physical violence um, uh, to oppress women. And also men control, as an extension of that physical violence, they control access to politics and access to education. And because they control access to both uh, um, uh, education and politics, uh, they are able to basically gatekeep power. And because they're able to gatekeep power, this prevents the uh, ability of women not only to be equal to men, but to ascend men. Remember, the argument here is that women are better than, than men, right? And therefore, it is only because of this like brute gatekeeping that Agrippa argues prevents women from basically uh, ascending uh, to a supreme position over, over and against men. And yes, Joan of Arc, it was Joan of Arc. I don't know how in the world uh, it slipped my mind, but it was Joan of Arc that he has in mind as a, a fine woman, or as a fine warrior woman. Um, this is just interesting, folks. Uh, I don't know if, if, if other folks have read Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, her argument in Vindication of the Rights of Women. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, several centuries after Agrippa, and I haven't checked this, but I wonder if Mary Wollstonecraft has read this book by Agrippa. I am sure that she has. But you probably know this. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, who is the mother of Mary Shelley, by the way, of Frankenstein fame, Mary Wollstonecraft makes the exact argument that Agrippa makes. It is almost the exact same argument. Now, Agrippa makes it in this sort of sappy kind of, um, I don't know, he kind of overdoes it. But um, Mary Wollstonecraft, who is now in many ways kind of lauded as the first feminist, uh, first modern feminist, I suppose, uh, she's going to make almost the exact argument, same argument that Agrippa does. Now, to what degree she's leaning on Agrippa to do that, I don't know, but the arguments are so conspicuously similar 
Uh, and she was so well read that I can't imagine that she that it is an accident. So again, is it the case that Agrippa is sort of the first dude feminist? I don't know. Uh, does he have an ulterior reason for writing this? Is he writing this, this out of the sheer analysis of women? Of course not. He's writing this uh, basically to butter up a woman to give him a job. Um, it, it, and it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because Agrippa has already been accused of Judaizing, and that is the nail in his coffin um, that ultimately uh, does him in. So what ends up happening, unfortunately, with the with the the three books of uh, not three books the the uh, they know but nobilitate is that she never even gets it because he's fired before he can even submit it to her. Uh, and fired is a strong word. Basically, it, it's made clear to him that he is not going to be able to get this job because once you're accused of a heresy like Judaizing, you're not going to be able to walk it off. And once you get a, you know, again, it's your first job. I mean, he doesn't have, you know, tenure or whatever. Out of the gate, it's a bad situation. Now, what ends up happening ultimately is he does end up presenting it to her 20 years later. Um, and uh, it's not clear that she reads it and it has no impact. Um, so this book is a, a, one of the example of a book where Agrippa was doing the right thing at one level. He was, you know, sucking up to the right person of power. He was making some pretty interesting arguments. To what degree this would have worked, I don't know, but he undermined himself by lecturing on this weird Kabbalistic stuff and then getting accused of Judaizing. And by the time the accusations of Judaizing, uh, by the time the, the, the dust clears on that, there's no chance that Margaret's going to give him a job. So it's done for. Uh, what is interesting is that the, the Declamation on the Nobility of Women is available in English. It uh, was published in 1996, so you can read it if you like. Um, but already, folks, in the in here by 1509, Agrippa's already thinking primarily in a Kabbalistic, thinking in a prim primarily Neoplatonic kind of way. So already he's primed to think this way. And I think that he's primed to think this way primarily because he's already knee deep in the occult philosophy. I would suspect he's already begun at this point to uh, compose the the DOP. Um, and again, uh, as we'll talk about next time in 1510, he will present the the draft of the, the juvenile draft of the three books of occult philosophy to Trithemius. So I think that he's writing the nobilitate uh, because in the way that he does, because he's already super saturated in the world of uh, esotericism more generally. So. Um, this is the first page, or one of the first pages of the juvenile draft. Um, and we're, we're going to introduce it a little bit here, but we're also going to be doing some stage setting for it today. But uh, he leaves uh, France in, in 1509 or 1510. We don't know exactly. He leaves France because he's not getting a job and it's just over. So he goes back to Germany. He'll travel to, uh, to Spondheim to visit with Trithemius, who I'll talk a little bit more in the next lecture. And he presents a, a completed version of the three books of the three books of occult philosophy to Trithemius, and Trithemius is pretty enthusiastic about them. Um, and we'll we'll talk more about the letter and all the stuff that he writes. But what's to understand at this point is that the juvenile draft, on its own, sometimes referred to as De Magia, which is what uh, uh, Agrippa wanted to publish it as, it is a real tour de force of 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 Bible, of classical literature, of hermetic philosophy, of Kabbalistic thinking, all marshaled, right? And the point of the text is to marshal all of this wisdom, as we'll see, in the interest of doing two things. One, as you have, we talked about already, is to reconcile the soul with God. It is to reunite the soul with the divine. And as you go up that process, right, as you learn to appreciate the divine world created by God, the terrestrial world, you will gain control over the terrestrial world, both the uh, apparent and the occult forces of the terrestrial world. As you turn your attention to mounting up into the celestial realm, you will also gain control over celestial forces, which are more powerful, of course, than terrestrial ones. So that will give you access to the kind of talismanic power that one acquires from the astral radiation raining down from the planetary bodies. 
And finally, as you mount all the way up into the divine world, as your soul uh, reaches up to the divine world, you will get uh, thaumaturgical powers. You'll get miraculous type of powers. And those thaumaturgical powers will be um, magic. It will be, um, uh, will be magic. It's all magic at some level, but that will be the real powerful stuff where you could do things like raise the dead. Um, and so those will be examples of, of things like that. So that's the goal of the DOP. Now, to understand this a little bit better, a lot bit better, we're going to have to turn to what I will refer to as uh, the Italian Magical Reformation, the attempt at a magical reformation. So one can sort of juxtapose two forms of magic that are operating in Europe at this time. The dominant form of magic that's, do that's operating in Europe is what we might consider the classical kind of uh, medieval necromancy represented uh, in a text like CLM 849, the Munich Necromancer's Manual. This is a, uh, the spell for invisibility. So typically the way this works, and this is with the exception of some planetary magic and, and some texts like the Ars Notoria, but typically the way that this worked was that you, you summoned a demon, you bound that demon using various techniques, and then you got that bound demon to do stuff for you and to you. You got them to turn you invisible. You got them to find you someone to have sex with. You got them to get you a magical horse. You got them to find you buried treasure or whatever. Typically, summon demon, bind demon, get them to work for you. That's the kind of classic necromantic magic that's dominant at this time. What's also emerging in Italy, more specifically, is a recovery, as you all know, of ancient pagan and Kabbalistic texts. In those pagan and Kabbalistic texts, the Corpus Hermeticum, the Orphic hymns, uh, the, the text of Kabbalah, the, uh, the Plato, all of that, this is all being drawn in. And the idea is that all of that material, her, the Hermetica, the, the Kabbalah, that all represents a more archaic, a more ancient, and therefore a more pure kind of magical practice. And that all of this demonic summoning stuff is all derivative and is in some sense all a corrupt version of a higher form of magic that's been lost, of Kabbalistic magic, of hermetic magic, of, of all these other forms of magic. And therefore, those forms of magic got lost, and what was left is a kind of decadent demonic magic. And that decadent demonic magic needs to be shelved. It needs to be shelved. There is a, a reaction against it. That's part of a larger reaction among humanists and among Renaissance people, sort of against all things medieval. This is where the term Gothic gets invented, uh, where they really hate on the scholastics. So it's a, it's a really, it's, it's, it's the magical equivalent of what's going on in humanism more generally, where everything medieval is, is just thought to be the worst. We can, we can typify this magical shift if you want, and this typification, like all typifications, is going to not be perfect, but think about it like this. What we're going to see here is a kind of shift in the Italian Renaissance from what I would call transactional magic, which is to say you trade something to get something, you, you do a transaction to get something in the case of dealing with a demon, to what I will call ex exaltative magic. Exaltative magic is where you're trying to engage in an internal spiritual transformation and by that internal spiritual transformation, one, as part of that process, acquires magical powers. See, these are very different. One is I contract or I deal with an exterior force, like a demon, and by dealing with that entity, I get something out of the deal. As opposed to I transform my own interior state, and through that transformation, I get some kind of increased power. These are very, very different kinds of theories about magic. So again, this is a transformatory form of magic versus a transactional one. And in general, right, it's, tra it's, a, it's a theurgical kind of magic. And what this is going to be informed by is primarily two big things. One, Pigo's adoption of Kabbalah, and two, Ficino's transformation of the concept of spiritus, right, of spiritus. So for Ficino, what he's going to argue for his part is that one aspect of the human being, our spiritus, that spiritus can be charged. It is a, it is a kind of um, a capacity. We are kind of spiritual capacitors. And if you charge that spiritus, 
via either charging it uh, in terms of uh, capturing planetary power or divine power more directly as a kind of vessel, you can obtain those kinds of charges from the different planets, like a, a, Jup a Jovian power, perhaps, or a Venusian power. You can charge your capacitor, your Spiritus, with those, because they're also Spiritus, and you obtain some of the power via that charging, if, for lack of a better word. The other part of this is going to be Pico's concept of dignitas. Dignitas is for Pico the idea that the human being has an inherent dignity, and that dignity is the result of having been created in the image of God. And in the same way that God has all kinds of magical powers, miraculous powers, human beings have access to that kind of power via their dignitas. Now, our dignitas has been damaged by, for instance, original sin, but it can also be damaged by other kinds of bad things that we do. But if we enhance our dignitas, and one of the ways of enhancing our dignitas is through Kabbalah and magic, if we can enhance our dignitas, we can achieve godlike powers because we're accepting at some level our birthright as having been forged in the very image of God. So both of these concepts are going to be dominating in Renaissance magic. The idea of spiritas, the idea of spiritus rather, this idea that we, are, uh, we have a capacity within us for our spiritus to connect with the spiritus of the planetary spheres or of God uh, or of angels or whatever. And we can charge that, but also the human being themselves has an inherent dignity having been made in the image of God. And we realize that dignity ultimately according to Pico, in uh, the practice of magic and, and Kabbalah. And of course, with strong adjuncts to Hermeticism, for folks who have read some Hermeticism, you know the Corpus of Medica will say things like, man is a kind of miracle. Or one of the most famous things that you constantly hear Ficino and Pico say is that man is a miracle, that the human beings are a miracle. Now, juxtapose that for how medieval people thought about human beings. Sinful, bad, fallen. We are not dignitas. We are, we are just like the crap on the bottom of God's boot. That's a very different conception, right, than, the, than this Renaissance shift where, no, we're, we, we, are, we are perfectible. We are, we are spiritually perfectible. That is very different than you're a fallen, sinful, bad person who you're lucky that God gives you any grace whatsoever for you to be able to, uh, to get redemption. Very different conceptions of a human being. Very different conceptions of the human being. Now, what's going to be shared by both this Renaissance shift, right, for what I would call this exaltative magic, but also what's shared in run-of-the-mill medieval magic, right, is things like metaphysical sympathies, which is to say that the entire universe is connected by all of these invisible occult metaphysical sympathies, and that one can affect those metaphysical sympathies and you can achieve things through affecting and interacting with those sympathies. Also the role of the occult sciences, things like astrology, things like alchemy, uh, knowing the occult nature of things like gems or metals or knowing, for instance, uh, how the universe works in terms of the occult nature of, of, the, of the, the harmony of the spheres and, and things like that. So crucial to all this is going to be what's shared metaphysical sympathies, the occult sciences, but also the big shift that's happening in, in Italy. So, as I mentioned, what's going out of the door is this focus on transactional magic uh, with demons as a means of control. Ficino, Pico, and Agrippa all reject that. All reject that. They are really down on that necromancy stuff. They think it is, they think it is beneath them, it's beneath their dignity. You do not, you, one does not exalt one's dignitas by cavorting with demons. You just don't. It's like cavorting with criminals, worse than criminals. They're demonic beings. You don't become better in the world by cavorting with those kinds of entities. So, and further, right? Um, you know, a, allowing ones to be manipulated by those demons ultimately, which you uh, damned anyway. They follow a very Augustan line here. But Rather than the idea that man has the ability to dominate over the demons through using things like divine names, there is a shift that allows for human dignitas to allow him to be free of forces. So notice this shift here again. 
one can, in the medieval understanding, one can use a divine name or a sigil to control a demon. And you can use that sigil to control that demon to get stuff. Therefore, man has the ability to instrumentalize something about God to manipulate demons to get stuff. That's the medieval renaissance, that's the medieval kind of necromantic magic. The shift now is no, dignitas actually allows me to be free of outside forces, especially fortuna, especially something like fortune or chance or luck. Rather than having the ability to dominate, it's a conception of power as freedom from. I am free from all these exterior forces, and that exalts me, and I am freer as a result of my dignity. So it's a shift in thinking away from domination as power to freedom as power. The magus is not the person who dominates over demons. The magus is the person who is free from forces like fortuna or astral forces or demonic control. So that's another really big shift that comes along with this. And that dignitas allows one to become godlike. That is the, the, uh, the part of us that allows our spiritus to become dignified. And it's because of that dignification that we are able to become reconciled to God and what uh, Ficino and Pico like to refer to the human being as the knot of the cosmos. We are the place in the cosmos where the body and the soul are tied together. And if we exalt the soul part, right, and that, the knot that is the human being, if we exalt the soul part, that part is connected at some level to God. And the more that we exalt that soul part of us, the more we can achieve reunion with the divine. Now, there have been mystics, of course, in the medieval period who were able to achieve union with the divine. Those are all the mystics that we know of, right? You can just go through and list all the mystics, Hildegard, and all of the kinds of stuff that we can think of as, as the mystics. But notice that mysticism in the Middle Ages was almost overwhelmingly a passive thing. You didn't choose to have union with God. God chose to unify with you. And in that moment of God unifying with you, you could become swallowed up into the, the Holy Trinity, a la uh, Angela Foligno or something. But you could not elect that. You could not like, then get union with God. God did it to you. You could not do that to God. This shift now happens. For Agrippa and Pico, because of your dignitas and because of the you being the knot of the cosmos and because of your the spiritus that you are, you can now actively mystify. You can now actively engage in mysticism. So no longer are you passively overwhelmed by the power of God. You are now actively able to start up the treadmill toward the divine. And how do you do that? Magic and Kabbalah, hermeticism, stuff like that. So this is the idea that mysticism is no longer a thing that happens to you. Mysticism is thing that you can now initiate. And this is a huge shift in thinking coming from the Middle Ages. So Renaissance magic is going to largely be all about this idea of actively inculcating reunion with the divine and cultivating miraculous power as the result. That is a dramatic difference in magical theory. Then I can use divine names to bind demons to get me stuff. A in fact, a totally different theory of magic. So what's going to fuel this? Neoplatonism, folks. You have to have a great chain of being cosmology to make this work. Because otherwise, you are amputated in your relationship from the divine. So what do you have to have? You have to have some kind of great chain of being connecting you back to the divine. That is exactly what you get in Neoplatonism. Hermeticism. Hermeticism has the idea that the human being is a kind of miracle. You are not just a fallen, bad, sinful person. No, you are a miracle. And you combine that with Kabbalah that says human beings are made B'Tselem Elohim, made in the image of God, and you can activate that image by cultivating one's dignitas, Put all these together, folks, and you turn that engine over, and you now have Renaissance magic. A totally radical reformation of magic along radical, radical lines, not available to medieval Europeans because they did not have access to Neoplatonism, they did not have access to Hermeticism, and they did not have access to, with the exception of Jewish people, Kabbalah. Now, 
Agrippa is going to be very much on board with this magical reformation. He's going to be like, this is amazing. This is fantastic. Yes, this is what I want to do. And the three books of occult philosophy in many ways are going to be the culmination of combining all these streams, right? The occult sciences over here, well, terrestrial stuff over there, right? The dignification of the human being, astrology, all of that theurgy, it's all going to be combined systematically into the three books of occult philosophy, which we're going to come back to, of course, uh, next time. But there's a problem. There's a kind of problem in all this. The problem with all this is that despite this reformation, at the very heart of definitely Ficino's project, and this is really outlined in the three books of life, three books on life, which you can read, it's a great translation of it, especially book three, is the role played by daemones. Daemones. Now, I use the word daemones here to keep you sort of in between what Agrippa's talking, or uh, Ficino's talking about. So there are angels, there are demons, and then there are spirits, planetary spirits, planetary intelligences, rather, I should call them, intelligences. Now, part of what, again, what Agrippa and Pico are breaking with is the idea of trying to manipulate these daemones. They do not like that engaging with spiritual creatures business. Rather, they opt for a much more talismanic kind of approach to doing magic. I can charge my spiritus or I can charge a talisman because in some sense, Jupiter or Venus or whatever, they're radiating this energy. And if you know how to capture that radiation, that radiation has a certain kind of tenor. And if you can capture it, you can instrumentalize it. This is classic talismanic magic if you know your Thabadib and Kura and other kinds of things like this. It's just like magnified in the human being. The issue is that if you read the three books on life very carefully, one of the ways that one can focus that radiation is through words and music, incantations. There's a problem. The problem is this. Words and music are only comprehensible are only understandable, are only uh, received at some level by intelligent beings. You can see the problem. The problem is that Ficino wants to have it two ways. He wants to have it such that the planetary objects, they, they emanate naturally this kind of radiation and you can capture it. And that's a kind of natural process, right? It's just happening all the time and you're just as a magus, you know how to capture it and instrumentalize it. But he also wants to have this idea that certain kinds of words, incantations, and certain kinds of music especially, they can also help to sort of stimulate that radiation. The problem is, in order for that to work, those planetary intelligences have to be able to understand the words, understand the music. They have to get like jived to the music. So if they are, their intelligences again. They're not merely radioactive kind of entities, they're intelligences. And in some sense, they're like daemones again. You're able to conjure them in a sense. And one of the problems that lies in this is that Facino admits that some of the planetary entities like Saturn are malefic. They're quasi demonic in some cases, depending on where they are in the sky and how things are going. And if you're conjuring them, couldn't you conjure them to do bad things, like hurt people, curse people, damage stuff, destroy cities like you do in Thabit Ibn Kor's talismans? Of course you can. What it looks like again is that it looks like demonic conjuration again. So what in some sense Pico and Agrippa have tried to exercise from their system is still haunting it. They're not able to totally remove these elements from their magical system. And how could they? It relies on these intelligences. So how does Ficino try to fix this? He's, he's aware of this problem. How does he try to fix it? Basically, the way that he tries to fix it is saying, well, if you have faith in God and you're pious, and he was a priest, you won't do those things. You won't do the bad things. Now, that's sort of where Agrippa or Ficino lands and where he ends it all, right? And I think it's a very weak way of, Basically, you know, if you're virtuous and godlike and you're really trying to do your dignity, you won't use Saturn to hurt people. But it's still there if you want to. It, it, it's a very kind of, um, you know, wing, wing, nudge, nudge kind of, you know, solution to this problem. Now, Grippa knows it's a problem, or rather, Ficino knows it's a problem. This is where we turn to 
the magical reformation and how it's taken up by Agrippa. How it's taken up by Agrippa. What Agrippa is going to do in the three books of occult philosophy is he's going to weld, in some sense, all of these forces into one systematic treatise. The first thing he's going to weld in book one is going to be the tradition of Albertism, which is to say the a real focus on the occult sciences and a focus on reading the book of nature. So book one of the three books of occult philosophy is in some sense going to be how to master terrestrial occult science. Book two is going to be, or rather the second thing is going to be the magical reformation, the dignification of the human soul via spiritus, via the ability of spiritus to ascend back to the celestial realm and eventually back to reunion with God. That's the Ficino Pico part of all of it. Third, he's going to combine Kabbalistic and Neoplatonic cosmic theory in the use of divine names. How do you get back up to the divine? You fuse yourself and your soul with meditations on divine names. So we have Kabbalah, and how do you get up there? Well, you have to rely on a Neoplatonic cosmology. So he's going to fuse those. That's why book three is so Kabbalistic because you're using divine names primarily as the mechanism, as sort of the vehicle that one rides in some sense back to reunion with the divine. But if you've also read book three and read it carefully, you also know that Agrippa is much more comfortable than Ficino and Pico with the role of spiritual intelligences, including demonic entities. Agrippa says, if you get all these powers, you're going to have the ability to manipulate all these beings, malevolent demons, planetary intelligences, and also any kind of other spirits that are down here, but, uh, you know, sort of uh, elemental spirits. Agrippa is far more comfortable than Ficino in allowing for the possibility of engaging in uh, what we might call transitive magic, right? For Ficino and Pico, this is all about an interior transformation. And that interior transformation does result in you getting thaumaturgical powers. Agrippa is much more, uh, much more uh, concerned about the transitivity of magic. It's not just about you internally, spiritually being transformed, but magic has, actually has to be able to affect the world. It has to be able to affect the world. And in that sense, he's much more comfortable with magic as a transitive thing, that you need to be able to affect the world and that is what you what you get uh, uh, access to via the magical properties. So, the Renaissance, in some sense, the, the the Italian Renaissance, shifts things to the interior. And Agrippa's like, we need to re-pendulate that back, because what's the point of magic if it doesn't change things? If you exalt your soul, and it's a psychological or spiritual internal change, that's cool, but magic, if we read about the history of magic, it's the ability to alter the outside world, to alter physical reality. And if you don't get those powers, why call it magic at all? It's just sort of like Renaissance self-help or Renaissance interior psychology or something. For Agrippa, the transitivity of magic is paramount. And in this way, Agrippa is much more like medieval magic. He's much more comfortable with that sort of medieval way of, of doing things or that medieval focus on magic as, as transitive, though um, he will not like the idea of transactional magic. So to wrap up this for today, right? Let's bring it all home in some sense, right? He's going to hand, he's gonna really hold on to magical transitivity, which is to say magic needs to affect the outside world. And that's gonna be primarily through the occult sciences, but also through uh, celestial influences in theurgy. So those are gonna be the three mechanisms by which you get magical transitivity, which is to say the occult sciences will operate here on the terrestrial plane. Celestial influence will give you power down here from the power you get from up there. And then theurgy gives you just wide open powers. Now, Agrippa's, Agrippa's sort of commitment to the theurgical stuff, but also his Prisca Theologia stuff is going to put him in kind of a, a strange position. If you've read book three of the three books of occult philosophy, you'll know this. Agrippa accepts, right, the supremacy of the Catholic Church. That the Catholic Church is the, the unique and really the only way into salvation via the sacraments, via the grace of God. But 
Agrippa in book three even says things like, you know, certain rites and ceremonies of religion, even religions that are not Christianity or not Catholicism, they're still effective. He takes this from like Tantius, by the way. And the idea is there are pagan and Jewish, pagan and Jewish practices which do effectively accentuate or activate cosmic and celestial forces. Even God will listen, according to Lactantius and Agrippa, even God will open up to the possibility of a Jewish or pagan ceremony because they're at least trying to elevate their souls, even though they're doing it perhaps in a, a, a wrong way. Even, sacri even pagan sacrifices can actuate this. Although obviously Agrippa says that Christ's sacrifice is the best and really the only true sacrifice, and that's how you really get power. But God even allows God to be actuated by pagan sacrifices. Now, this is going to open the door for Agrippa to be accused of a weird kind of thing. This he's, he will be accused of this. One, ritual perennialism. The idea that pagans and Jews can, in some sense, do effective magic via God, despite the fact that they're outside the church. That should not be happening, but they, it, it does work for him. And secondly, he says, one can offer to spiritual intelligences, spiritual creatures, certain kinds of, uh, of uh, honor. And by offering them that kind of honor, you can trade things for, with them. You can engage in this transactional magic again, the kind, same kind of transactional magic that a Facino and Agrippa or Facino and Pico have rejected. Agrippa smuggles it back in. Now, this is incredibly important for my folks who know my who know Inquisition stuff, because the one thing that will get you accused of heresy by the Inquisition is offering dulia and latria, devotion and honor or worship to anything other than objects that uh, that uh, that sh should get that. You can give dulia and latria to saints. You can give dulia and latria to 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 the, to God to Mary maybe to angels, but absolutely to nothing else. Because if you give honor and worship to anything else, you're engaging in paganism, basically, idolatry, and that is a violation. And that sets you up for charges of heresy. How does, how does Agrippa get around this? He argues that as one's spiritus becomes more and more elevated, as one becomes more and more dignified, that is a hedge against malefic forces. So that's classic sort of the magus is the magus in that one is freed from those forces. If one relies on the sacrifice of Christ as being the truest and the best of those, right? One will only, one will know through a kind of spiritual intuition what, how to avoid what he calls perverse devotion and veneration. So the idea is one will one will avoid giving improper dulia and latria, and therefore one will avoid heresy because, almost mechanically so, as one is elevated, dignified, one will, one, be protected from such forces, right? They won't even be able to approach you. And two, you will, by, as a kind of magical intuition, you will know the proper kind of honors to give to the right kind of spiritual beings. Is that going to work? It definitely doesn't. This book is put on the index of prohibited books because basically he says, yeah, you'll kind of know it when you know it. And the Inquisition looked at that and goes, no, you won't. Why? Because you're a fallen sinful person and the entire task of demons is to trick people into giving them uh, Dulia and Latria in order to damn them. That is the entire game that demons play, is tricking people into doing this. In Agrippa, you're not going to be able to protect yourself because you've been able to self-elevate yourself above the sins that you've inherited from Adam and Eve. So what we're going to get in next time, when we really turn to the three books of occult philosophy, the 1510, is what we're going to be tracking is we're going to be tracking these exact problems. How does Agrippa absorb 
the Ficino Pico Reformation stuff, magical reformation. How does he keep another hand over here on medieval magic, which Agrippa is much more comfortable with? And how does he try to combine all of this Hermeticism, all of this Kabbalah, all this Neoplatonism with both of those, with both the medieval stuff that he wants to hold on to to some degree and this Italian stuff that's coming along? How does he hold all of it together? And the question is, does it all work? Does it all work? Does it allow him to generate a system of magic that takes all of the Italian Reformation stuff, some of the medieval stuff, right? And then puts it all together in a package that does not commit heresy. Because that matters for Agrippa, because he wants to get this book published, because he wants to argue that at the very heart of Christianity, this is an authentic way of being a Christian. And if what happens, and again, this probably doesn't matter to you if you're not a Christian, but I mean, a Catholic even, but what matters deeply for Agrippa is that he can combine all of those things into one package that doesn't cross the line into heresy. Because he, because he so deeply believes that this is the recovery of an authentic spiritual practice going all the way back to Moses and all the way back to Adam. And that Adam in paradise, at some level, combined all of these powers, and that was what it was like to be sinless. Now, is he going to be successful at that? The Inquisition says no. You might not even care because you're not a Christian or a Catholic, but it will matter because if it doesn't work, then at some level, the three books of occult philosophy is, is in, internally incoherent. I think he comes pretty close, but we'll get into the weeds of that next time we actually turn definitively to the, uh, the juvenile draft of 1510.